Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're joining in from today. Welcome to another live session at The Reactor. My name is Rav and I'm the program manager here at Reactor London. Um, before we get into the session, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We're all here to learn. So please be respectful, please be kind, please be considerate. Um, the chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. We are back with the last episode of 10 Tuesdays to AZ900. Today is all about monitoring your Azure resources. Um, and please know that this is the last session. If you have missed the previous sessions, I will post a link into the chat uh, to the previous sessions and you can go have a look on those. Um, you can catch up on all the previous videos. So with that, I am now going to add Johan um, onto the screen and he will take over. Hello. Hello, hello. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rav. So um, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world right now. Um, even if you're watching this later on on, on, on the stream, it's all good. Um, welcome to the last episode, as Rav mentioned, of uh, 10 Days to, to Azure Fundamentals. This is the, the last uh, session that we're doing. And today we're going to chat about something that's pretty close to my heart. <laughs> I, um, I I love some of our monitoring tools. The information you can get out of these are quite um, you know are quite vast, quite impressive. So um, you know, without any further ado, my name is Johan Meiberg. I'm a, a Microsoft technical trainer with Microsoft here in the UK. You'll probably hear from my accent that I'm a South African. Uh, you know, born in South Africa. I um, immigrated to the UK sort of early uh, towards early uh, last year, January the 1st, actually. Um, and you'll see some of my details there, right? My email address, if you want to contact me, my Twitter handle, as well as my LinkedIn profile, if you want to connect, I'll be um, happy to connect. Um, it's not my first role at Microsoft. I was a cloud solution architect, and I'm pretty passionate about community and uh, sharing knowledge, right? I live just outside of London, but enough about me. Let's uh, get into some of the content. I've got a good couple of demos to actually pull up here. So monitoring tools, let's, we're going to first look at why monitoring is important. You know, why do we need to do this? And, and what are some of the benefits we can get out of it? Then we will start delving into some of the tools we've got available, Azure Advisor, um, uh, Azure Service Health. And of course, as far as the exam and preparation for that is concerned, you need to probably start making notes about all these different services and what you will use them for, right? And that's what they'll be testing in the exam with the um, AZ900 certification. Uh, we will then uh, look at the Azure Monitor service as a whole, uh, cover some of the topics related to Azure Monitor and how you might you know, view some of this data. We will then also look at the log analytics tooling, right? Um, focus a little bit on alerts. And then after that, we will look at the app insights. And I've got a pretty comprehensive demo that we will look at insights where I've instrumented a little custom application that I've got running locally on my machine here, and I'm sending some telemetry information through to, to App Insights where I can query this information and look at it you know, in a graph, for example. So let's, let, let's not waffle around a bit uh, I mean, I'm too much longer. Um, why monitor, right? And, and the reality is the minute you start monitoring your solutions, uh, it's going to it's going to um, it's going to allow you to have insight into your services and applications and workloads that will allow you to see where you can tweak them right and how you can get better value for money from a costing perspective how you can make your services more reliable um, as a whole uh, and um, and how you can make your applications more secure. Uh, uh, of course, uh, performance is also, uh, you know, uh, one of the top things that you might want to look at. And if you, uh, if you're, you know, where traditionally, if you're provisioning resources in an on-prem environment, uh, you know, we tend to kind of over overspec those resources, right? It's difficult to go back to business and ask them for additional sort of uh, resources and additional capital to, you know. If we've, if we've just come off a big project where we spent X amount of dollars and now we realize, oh, you know, we don't have enough resources, we should have rather spec the virtual machines a bit higher or whatever the case is, right? So in the cloud, we don't really have that problem, right? We can resize our resources 
on the fly. Um, there might be a little bit of downtime there, but it's actually a drop in the ocean with regards to the amount of time that that um, your application might be down if it is not performing right. If it's flatlining the CPU, if it's if it's under attack even from a security perspective. So so as opposed to over specking your cloud resources, what you want to do is you want to kind of baseline your resources in the cloud and monitor them for a period of time, in, in fact, ongoing for that matter, and see that, hang on for a second, these virtual machines are, for example, um, idling at sort of, you know, 30% CPU spiking into 50%. That sort of virtual machine can be downsized, right? You can, you can take, you can remove some of the resources and pay a little bit less for the virtual machine and get a little bit more value for money, right? So that it sort of idles at 60, 50, 65% CPU and spikes into the 80s, mid sort of 80s sort of CPU usage. That means that you're getting value for what you're paying for. And to this end, you can really optimize your cost um, uh, and your overall operational excellence. So performance, security, reliability, all these aspects are things that you can improve in your in your in your workloads by using monitoring effectively and understanding what is happening in your environment. And just looking at these uh, bullet points on the right hand side, there's a specific service that looks at these points, um, you know, uh, uh, specifically called the Azure Advisor. Now, the, <laughs> the Azure Advisor. Um, I always say the Azure Advisor is a little bit like a backseat driver. I'm not sure if you know what a backseat driver is. A backseat driver is usually um, uh, someone that's sitting in the backseat that's leaning over the driver's shoulder, you know, barking out instructions like, barking out instructions like, um, oh, you should have put on your indicator there. Uh, oh, you should have, uh, you, you didn't stop at that stop street. Typically things that we all know, but it's not nice to hear some of these things, right? The Azure Advisor is exactly like that backseat driver, right? It's constantly giving you recommendations on how you can improve your workloads, how you can make them more secure, how you can save, you know, on the cost side of things, how you can increase your operational excellence performance and your reliability of your different services and workloads by whispering over your shoulder, looking at what you are doing and telling you where you can improve in certain areas, right? It's good to take a look at the... Uh, at, um, at the service there, you can see the Azure Advisor. This is essentially showing me an overview. And there you can see that there's a cost, um, a cost component. There's a security component. There's a whole bunch of recommendations behind that, by the way. There's some reliability considerations, mostly sort of medium impact, as you can see. But if I scroll down, you'll see that there is some operational excellence, low impact options. And then there's a medium impact performance recommendation that I can also have. You'll notice that the advisor has essentially got an advisor score, right? So you can see that from this advisor score, I can essentially have a sort of target in place and say to ourselves, well, within the next month or so, we want our advisor score to be at a certain level, right? And let's see how many of these things we can fix. If I click through on my security here, you will notice that we've even got, you know, there are some of the high impact options. There should be more than one owner assigned to subscriptions, right? You need to create some sort of a break the glass type account. There you can also see virtual machines should encrypt temporary disks, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a nice one. Um, you'll see secure transfers to storage accounts should be enabled. By the way, there's a quick fix there, right? So the Azure Advisor even has some remediation options that allows me to click on that and it will actually even, you know, fix the problem on my behalf. There's fix this resource, and within a few seconds, this this uh, this issue is actually gone, right? So I can go and refresh this, and you'll see immediately my score has gone up. So there you can see on the left hand side, there's my cost, reliability, security, all sort of recommendations rolled into one, and I can actually go and, you know, I can piecemeal work through my subscriptions and go and fix these individual items that will allow me to improve my operational, um, my, my, you know, my, my Azure Advisor score. I hope that made sense. So, so that's the Azure Advisor and the Azure Advisor will look at these different categories specifically 
and outline, you know, what is cooking there and, and how you can improve. So uh, invaluable service, very often overlooked. Um, uh, and, um, and probably your starting point to improving, uh, you know, the, the, the day to day sort of running and management and life cycle of your resources in the cloud. If you are not sure where to start with Azure, start with the Azure advisor. All right, then the other option here is the Azure Service Health, right? So if I if I go, for example, to uh, to the monitor here, ooh, hang on for a second, not there, in here. here, you can see I've got the Azure monitor. One of the options I see here is Service Health, right? You can see I've got that Service Health option there. And if I click on Service Health, it's essentially going to take me through to the Service Health portal you'll notice from the portal that we've got essentially, you know, service issues, if I had any, right? Um, and I can go and create alerts here that shows, whoa, well, there's something happening in this specific region. If I, if, I, if I want those sort of alerts, we'll talk about alerts later on. Uh, and then on top of that, also some planned maintenance. Right now, you'll see that everything seems healthy, right? I don't have any issues right now. I've also got some planned maintenance here. And you'll notice that from this perspective, it's showing me um, you know, some sort of a planned maintenance, right? The, the, this is something that Microsoft is planning on doing that might affect, you know, some of my workloads. And you'll notice that I, if there was a long list, which there isn't, I can actually go and say, I only want to see alerts um, uh, and, uh, you know, planned maintenance for Azure Active Directory, for example. So I can be quite specific and whittle these down with this, uh, you know, with uh, this type of a workbook type approach and say, well, you know, these are the issues. You'll also notice if I click through on the issue, it's going to give me a summary of the issue, you know, um, the impact category, maintenance summary. Um, and then on top of that, I can actually, you know, look at any issue updates that I might have, that, you know, that might have come through um, at this point in time. You'll see the maintenance start and end dates. Those are the times. And if I wanted to, I can even go and download, um, you know, a PDF document that's effectively going to, uh, you know, that's essentially going to, that I can take to management and say, well, you know, we've, we're going to probably have some downtime. Here is the official sort of, you know, communication from Microsoft and and you can then, you know, take this, this further. And of course, you know, the usual sort of, you know, connection options speak to our support folks um, over on Twitter. Uh, this um, uh, this uh, Twitter handle, Azure Support, is probably one of the most helpful, you know, uh, um, tools that you can have if you're using Azure. We've got some engineers that man that almost on a constant basis, right? In fact, constantly, right? It's kind of part of their role from what I understand. All right, so that's the service health. You also see some health advisories in here, right? Some recommendations, just to give you an idea, and also some security advisories that also roll in here, right? And there you can see some specific resource health um, items. And again, I can go and create alerts that will essentially show me, hey, I want an alert for this type of resource, any type of resource. If there's any sort of issue, you know, let me know. So this is this is the you know this is the uh, the service health portal. Two of your most sort of you know. Um, renowned sort of tools inside of Azure from a monitoring perspective and an overall sort of, you know, um, recommendation perspective that'll, that'll, that'll uh, you know, tell you when things are going wrong and what you can do to at least make certain aspects, you know, more reliable, more, you know, secure, more, more cost effective, et cetera. And then I want to just briefly touch on the Azure monitor as a whole right now. You'll notice that this is a again a, a, almost a subset of the original sort of um, you know uh, diagram that we've had on on our Learn channel for a very very long time. Uh, so you'll see that the Azure Monitor is basically a, a global service that takes information from your workloads, your infrastructure, the Azure platform as a whole, tenant level, subscription level, etc and feeds this information into, you know, the Azure Monitor, where it's essentially manifesting as logs. And then from those logs, you can actually go and build out, you know, certain sort of views, reports, dashboards, et cetera, certain, you know, show certain metrics, you know, query some of that log data if you wanted to. You will notice that we've also got custom sources here, right? So 
not only some of the existing infrastructure and, and services inside of Azure, but you can also use, um, you know, the Azure Monitor and, you know, related sort of tools like App Insights to build some custom telemetry into your applications, for example, and send some custom telemetry information to the cloud where you can go and further um, analyze this information in any which way you want to do that. So you'll notice that, that you know, I'll demo some of these custom sources for you in a bit, and then we'll get to App Insights a bit later on. So a little bit later on towards the end of the call, I'm going to talk a little bit about custom sources, talk a little bit about App Insights, and then show you some log analytics on how I can query some of that custom telemetry data that I'm sending through from my, from my application that's running locally. Other than that, you will see that, um, you know, we've got essentially an insights component for more than just application insights, right? So application insights is essentially a service that has got a cost involved, right? But we've got some insights for all sorts of services in Azure. Let me give you an example of that. If I, if I, go, if I go look at the Azure monitor and just scroll down here for a section, you'll notice that there's my application insights, right? But there's also insights for virtual machines. There's also insights for storage accounts, right? Now, App Insights is a very specific service with an associated cost and a huge amount of capability. Um, but we are trying to give you some standard sort of insights components and dashboarding and reporting around most of these services. There you can see, you know, storage accounts, containers for your Kubernetes clusters, um, you know, networks, just as an example. I don't think I've got any networks, but if I had lots of networks, then you'll see, it'll show me some load balances here. It'll, it'll show me my connectivity. It'll show me certain traffic, you know, that I might actually have. But for example, on my storage accounts, you'll notice that there's, there's an overview, there's transactions, there's a transaction timeline for my various storage accounts. And they're from a, a E2E latency, a server latency, sort of errors that I might be getting, et cetera. I've also got some capacity sort of, you know, dashboards going here where you can see, you know, um, you know as I can expand this and you can see that this is the amount um, of items I've used here, um, et cetera. The blob capacity, the file, the queue, and the table capacity to this end. And you can see that I'm actually using some tables on, um, you know, on my always on cloud storage account, right? So, so we've got insights not just app insights, which is that separate service I'm talking about, and more details on that a bit later on, but we've also got insights for most of our other services. There you can see key vaults, right? I don't think I've got a key vault right now, but there's Azure Cache for Redis, uh, you know, log analytics workspaces, service bus, you know, information. And you can see I've got a service bus going there. There you can see the number of requests, the number of messages to my service bus, et cetera. Right, so, so we've got an insights component that's effectively going to give us high level and some drill down insight capabilities into certain services, right? How many pods are running on my uh, Kubernetes container? What is my virtual network doing from a, from a, a traffic perspective, et cetera, et cetera. On top of those insights components at the top here, these over here is what I'm talking about, We've also got, you know, we've also got some additional visualization tools, right? One of them is called workbooks. And actually, this is actually a workbook, right? And I can customize this workbook if I wanted to, right? And add some items, add some fields. You'll notice if I scroll to the top here in the Azure Monitor, I've got a workbook section there. And I can either start with a new workbook, right? A completely empty workbook where I can actually go and add some text add some parameters, add links and tabs, add some queries, et cetera, metrics, and add a grouping component if I wanted to. And this would effectively allow me to create almost like a master detail type view of whatever resource I want to be viewing. So workbooks is one of them. And if I go, you know, if I close down this one and go back to workbooks again, then you'll see if I scroll down just a section, there is some application performance analysis, right? And you can see that currently I've got, you know, three applications. There's, uh, you know, 
um, you know, recurring requests. There's get requests, and I can actually go and drill down further on these. You can see there for the last 48 hours, and it'll show me a little bit more information around that. There's a number of, you know, account, there's a trend, etc. So, so you can actually go and tweak some of these workbooks and unpack some additional information in there to your arts content. And there you can see some additional metrics, right? What is the mean there, right? What is the, uh, the, the, the median? Uh, show me all the default items, for example. Right, so, so one, of the, one of the visualization components is workbooks. We've also got dashboards inside of Azure. Azure. If you were not familiar with that, if I, click, uh, if I click on the hamburger button at the top here, you'll notice that there's a dashboard there, right? And I can actually go and create an additional dashboard and I can say that I'm gonna start with a custom dashboard, right? And I'm gonna call this um, AZ204. This is the course I'm busy training this week, the Azure Developer Course. And um, so I'll use this later on in the week and I can go and drag you know, things like my resource groups on there. So I've got a central point to look at. I can put a clock on there and um, I can go and hit done and save there. And you'll notice that within a few seconds, there's my, my dashboard. I'm starting to add some items and I can shove this into a full screen mode and stick it on the side of my operations center if I wanted to and actually get everyone to take a look at what's, you know, what's happening in the environment. Right, so, so I will actually push some additional information into this dashboard as we are going through some of these other services. So, so just um, give me a few seconds and I'll start adding some additional items on here. Um, but let's go back to the monitor just, uh, just briefly. So the monitor, um, you know, the monitor will essentially give me certain components that I can publish onto these dashboards and I'll add dashboards and I'll get back to that. I'll show some of the uh, some of those to you in, in a bit. But we can also use, um, you know, other Microsoft tools like Power BI. We can connect Power BI to the Azure Monitor uh, information and build some custom reports in Power BI if we wanted to. But nothing is stopping you from using a third-party tool like Grafana. Grafana is a, a open source, very well-known sort of dashboarding tool for operational sort of analytics gives me the ability to build some pretty complex dashboards, um, uh, you know, with connectors through to, to Azure and other cloud services for that matter as well, right? So we can connect our Azure monitor data to a variety of different, um, you know, uh, tools that we can use to visualize um, and, um, you know, graphically display the information um, so we can analyze it in, in more depth. And then, of course, I've got you know, the analyze component here, what will we use to analyze all this information? And if I had to, if I had to go to, uh, for example, my, um, one of my app services, here we go, I've got an app service, there's a 204 app service, and I scroll down here, you'll notice that there's a metric section here, and the metric section will allow me to specify you know, my number of connections, just as an example, four connections on average. Um, in fact, I can go and add another metric if I wanted to, and this metric could be something like, you know, data out, just as an example. It's messing up, it's messing up my graph a little bit, and I don't want that. Let me rather choose something else, like, for example, let's look at the number of requests that we got, right? So I can actually go and build out one of these, um, you know, using this metric explorer is what it's called. And I can go and change this from a line chart to a bar chart if I wanted to, uh, you know, scattered chart. If I really wanted to do this, I'm going to go back to the line chart. And you'll notice from there, I can actually go and pin it to a dashboard. I can even pin it straight to Grafana from here. And if I specify you know, my dashboard, there you can see, you know, I should have my sort of, you know, 204 AZ204 dashboard there, or I can go and create a new one and hit the pin button, and it'll actually go and pin it to that dashboard of mine. So if I, again, go to my um, dashboards here, then there you'll see some of that information start putting through here, all right? Centralized sort of dashboard capability that we can take from our metric explorer, and we can, uh, you know, send this information straight through to, to a dashboard 
where we can go and further analyze this information. Uh, we're about sort of almost halfway now. So um, uh, there's a, there's a, one or two things I want to do just briefly. Um, I'm going to get back to this. But before I do that, let's just quickly um, uh, look at this slide here. Uh, you, as we've been doing for the last, uh, I think, seven um, you know sessions, uh, we've got this uh, QR code that you can scan and go fill out some details. The event ID that you want to fill out here is 17 nine seven one and if you have done this uh, you know for five out of the last seven uh, sessions then you will essentially get a 50 percent discount voucher to be able to you know register for this exam and go and write this exam right the fundamentals exams and the certifications don't expire so it's well worth getting your certification under the belt so just once again scan this qr code um, type in, uh, use this code, 17971, and um, that's the event ID, effectively. And um, if you've, um, you know, stuck to these rules here, then you'll actually be able to go and, uh, you know, register for that exam uh, with a 50% discount. Thanks for, uh, you know, Rav and them for actually arranging that. Uh, it's, been, it's been great for them to actually offer that to, to you guys. All right, so... Now, we've worked through most of these in, in a way, but there's a couple of options at the bottom here, right? There's a respond option, as you can see there. And under respond, I've got alerts and actions, and I've got auto scale. Now, auto scale is that cloud elasticity that we usually refer to where we can have something like a virtual machine cluster, and we can grow and shrink the cluster by doing horizontal scaling as you know, as the workload increases or decreases, it is the Azure Monitor that is doing that auto scaling, right? Well, it's the Azure Monitor that is monitoring the thresholds and then instructing the Azure Resource Manager to add an uh, instance to the cluster, right? Or remove an instance from the cluster. So the Azure Monitor does a little bit more than just hey, monitoring stuff. It actually is the tool behind the scenes. If, I put, if I'm creating from a costing perspective a budget on my subscription, the alert that I get to say that I'm on 80% of my, of my budget, it's the Azure Monitor that's monitoring that threshold. So anything to do with monitoring or monitoring a specific threshold, it's the Azure Monitor that is doing that. All right. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I'm not going to demonstrate the auto scale, but I will, though, um, you know, show you uh, an alert and how I can create an alert on the environment. So let's quickly take a look at alerts. Now, I'm going to go into my. Uh, let's go for app services, just as an example. I'm going to go for this app service, my Jazz to a four app service, and if I scroll down to the bottom here then you will see that there is a alert section, right? So I can go and create a new alert. There you can see alert rule. And I can base this alert rule on HTTP server errors, uh, the response time, right? Uh, you know, whatever else. Let's go for HTTP server errors for that matter. There hasn't been any, there hasn't been any, uh, uh, any server errors, but if I bump this over the last three days and hit apply, there was an error at some point in time. So I can actually create this alert and I can get some real-time data here to say, but the alert that you are busy, the threshold that you're busy setting right now is unrealistic. You are going to get constant alerts or you are never going to hit this threshold at all, right? So it'll give me an idea of what is currently happening on the environment and this will, this will sort of lead me towards a more realistic approach in terms of creating this alert. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm not going to make any changes here. You'll see that I can specify the alert logic and conditions uh, in, in, in a great amount of detail, right? If the, uh, if the HTTP server errors in total was greater than a count, for example, of a threshold, like in this case, one, so I might make this something like, for example, um, you know, something like I can drag it actually up from there and say, well, if it ever goes over 3.5, right? And, you know, it's, it's got some, some proper detail there. Then, um, you know, then trigger this alert and send us an alert. Now, um, 
I can also split it by dimensions if I wanted to. Check every one minute, loop back period. I can specify some additional conditions if I wanted to, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to head off to the actions here. So there's the scope, the condition, and the actions. And I can go and add some existing action groups. Action groups are reusable. So I, I want to point that out, you know, in no uncertain terms. And you'll see in a minute what I mean by that. If I create a new action group, and you can see that I'm creating it here in my training subscription, for example, under my resource group 204, and I can call this one the, um, the app error, um, you know, uh, or let's rather call it the HTTP error um, action group. Then you'll notice from a notification perspective, I can go and specify that all the people in a specific role, in this case, I'm going to say someone who's an owner on the resource, right? Owners. In addition to that, everyone that is a contributor. And on top of that, also everyone that has got read permissions, right? Readers. And, and, and I, can, I can specify any of these sort of roles. And this is what I mean by the action group is reusable. So if I create a rule on the application A, whoever are in these roles will get notified. If I, if I create the rule on application B, whoever is, on, whoever is in the role on application B will get the notifications. So I'm not hooking this up to a specific a person or group of people. I'm hooking this up to whoever has got these types of permissions on the resource. So I can reuse this rule anywhere I want, on virtual machines, on app services, on the IoT hub, on anything I want. And I can reuse this as many times as I want. On top of that, I can also specify an email, SMS, mobile app and voice message to go to certain folks and in here i can go and type mabel.gmail.com for example this is my personal email address someone that might not necessarily have these types of permissions on on the resource but maybe an external consultant of sorts that i want to get notified oh something has happened you know we're getting errors maybe the developer or something right that's not internal to my organization so they might not even have access to azure I can send them a message going, well, things are croaking and, um, and you need to sort this out. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to call this one consultants, just so that we know that this, you know, this is, this is not someone that's got permissions. This is someone that's actually external to the organization. And then last but not least, you can see that I've got certain action types, right? So from this perspective, it might be that the issue I'm experiencing is something I can fix in a script, a PowerShell script, a CLI command, something like that. So I can call what's known as an automation runbook. An automation runbook is essentially, uh, you know, PowerShell script, even a Python script for that matter, some sort of a scripting mechanism that I might use to remedy the situation. Maybe the threshold that I'm setting is, I need more scale. I need more CPU. Maybe I've got written a PowerShell script that will increase my, my, my size of my VM, for example, right? That will resize the web application. That will scale the web application manually to a certain you know, size so that it can handle the load. So I might remedy the situation in a runbook by building a script or something. I can call an Azure function. As you might know, um, Azure functions can also run PowerShell scripts. So maybe I've got a PowerShell script that I've in, you know, embedded in an Azure function, and I want this function to go sort out the issue. I can, I can do a couple of things here. Send it to an event hub. Um, the event hub is essentially a Kafka cluster that, I, you know, that I've essentially got you know, some windowed queries that I can run to say, what, what app services had more than five errors in... 20 minutes time over the last five weeks. Just, you know, that's the sort of queries that you can get out of the event up. Excuse me, I think I'm getting a bit sick. Uh, 
I've also got an ITSM endpoint here that essentially allows me to specify something like, you know, if if I was um, if I was uh, using an ITSM or ticket management system, then you'll see if I click there, it's going to show me that you know maybe maybe you're using something like uh, like service now, maybe you've got system center manager, maybe you're using Province or Sharewell or one of those systems for 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 ticket management we can essentially integrate into those ticket management systems and we can push you know the message and the ticket out to those systems so you can continue to manage those these um, issues in your existing system if you're using something like ServiceNow or one of those other cloud type solutions and then last but not least if i want to you know if i want to create a little custom business process around this i might i might use logic apps right logic apps allows me to build you know, extensive sort of business processes without writing code. So this is almost the opposite. This is almost the opposite of uh, opposite of Azure Functions. With Azure Functions, I'll build the process with code. With Logic Apps, I will model the process with a with a graphical editor. Right. So send the mail to these guys. Then, if the severity is over three, then do this. Update this. And the benefit of using logic apps is we've got a massive amount of endpoints that we integrate with. So I can tell you now, you name an application, we've got a connector for that, right? So you're thinking of something like Jira, for example, we've got a connector for that. You're thinking of SAP, we've got a connector for SAP, right? So there's hundreds of connectors in, in logic apps. So your integration is already built there for you. You don't have to worry about that. And then last, these two options, just secure webhooks. I might have a HTTP endpoint, and I just want to send this message to the HTTP endpoint, and you know, it's an app that does whatever it does. I'm going to um, click on tags next, and then I'm going to click on review and create. Whoops, the daisies! It's uh, saying to me that I forgot something there. So I can review and create the action group. The action group is created now, and it takes me back to my alert rule. And now I've just got the details section to go and fill out. You can see that I can specify the severity here. Is it going to be critical? Is this, this is an error, et cetera, et cetera. Um, HTTP error, a proper description of what the error is. So everyone that gets the message knows this is a SD, GHD, GG, G, SD issue. I'm being facetious now, of course. Um, and then under advanced option, I can also uh, options. I can also, you know, go and send some, you know, custom properties, right? So I can say, for example, that this is um, this specific scenario, right? Under the this is the exact conditions under which this alert was created, and this is custom information and properties that I can essentially pull through to my, you know pull through into my alert and I can click on review and create here and it will actually create this alert rule and if I get any sort of HTTP error like that again it'll trigger that alert and we will get notifications of that alert of like hey this has actually happened this threshold was exceeded this issue has actually appeared now in the environment all right um, along with all the other notifications that will go out to consultants integration into my ITSM system, everything that you see there, it'll all kind of come together there. All right, so, so this is essentially your alerts as well as your integration from that perspective, right? Now, let's, uh, let's uh, just uh, take a step forward here. I've already mentioned this. I'll mention this again. This is the code for today, 17971. And you can scan this barcode and you can actually go and, um, you know, uh, if you've got five out of the last seven, you can actually claim 50% of the uh, exam sort of, um, you know, costs to write this exam. Uh, I've got two more slides to cover here and then I'm basically done. Uh, so, well, three more slides, actually. This one is Log Analytics. Now, what is Log Analytics? Log Analytics Everything that goes into the Azure Monitor is essentially stored in logs, right? You can even bring your custom logs. We've got a log analytics agent that we can implement in our on-premises environment, and it'll send logs to the Azure environment. So once I've got my log information in there, I can start querying these logs. 
I can query these logs by using something known as the custo query language, right? It's a very specific language, very SQL-like language that allows me to, custo, to create custom queries to interrogate these, these, you know, these uh, log files. You'll notice from here that I can have my results in a table or I can have my results in a chart. I can even go and share this chart and publish it onto a specific, specific dashboard if I want, right? We can create not only simple, but very complex queries that groups by, um, that, you know, uh, segregate certain results, et cetera. And we can, we can visualize these results as well as set alerts so that if these thresholds are exceeded or if there are new items in the list, that it sends us one of those alerts that we just configured. So let me show you some of that quickly. And before I do that, I've got this, uh, I've got an app right, that is running locally. And this app is sending some telemetry information, right? There you can see localhost. By the way, I'm going to hit refresh a couple of times. It's doing an error, but, you know, I can see it's doing a 404 error. But um, I'm doing this on purpose, right, generating some errors. I'm going to create a new tab here. And I'm going to go for weather forecast, and I'm going to do some weather forecasts, right? Ta-da! There's a couple of random weather forecasts. So, if I go, if I go into my log analytics area here, you'll see that I can actually go and query traces where the message starts with weather, right? And there you can see no weather at all, severe weather. Um, I can actually go and query this to my heart's content. There's, you know, it's mostly severe weather that's coming through, but that's not the point, All right? So I can, um, I instrumented my application with, uh, you know, uh, this uh, app insights um, you know, telemetry ID, and I can actually start this, uh, instrumenting my application and send custom trace information into app insights in this instance that I can actually go and query later on with this custom information. So this information you see here is not information that's come from Azure. It's information that has actually come from my local application that's running on my local host. There you can see, you know, sort of local host. And uh, this is also the local host that you can see there. All right, so complete custom uh, telemetry around that. Another example, in fact, if I click on chart here, it'll show me my weather options, right? Um, pie chart, line chart, whatever kind of charts you want, actually. So I've also got this one, which is essentially a web application. Top countries by traffic. If I hit that, it's going to show me the chart. And you can see there, most of my traffic, 45% is coming from the United Kingdom. Seven, you know, 54% is coming from other countries, right? And on top of this, I can actually go and pin this to an Azure dashboard if I wanted to. And I can go and pin that to that, uh, you know, uh, AZ, where is that dashboard now? I was sure it was here. Uh, mm, interesting. It's not showing here. Oh, of course. Let me just reload this. And let me just go for... Let me just go for queries and search for country, countries by traffic. And I can actually go and pin this to my Azure dashboard and it should show that one now. Ah, there we go, AZ204, hit the pin button. And if I go back here to my dashboards, there's my, there's my 204 dashboard. And you'll see that it's actually gone and pinned that information in here as well. All right. So, it's it's not it's not just allowing me to show my results in a specific table format. We can even use these this log analytics workspace and the custom query language to effectively generate some charts based on the log data that we're querying. And there you can see I can go and publish this to wherever I want to publish it to. And that's the log analytics workspace, right? Log analytics workspace complex queries on your logs, 
visualize results, even set alerts, right? So trigger some alerts behind the scenes there. Um, I've already mentioned alerts, but there you can see some scenarios. A virtual machine CPU is over 90%. Web app disk or HTTPQ length is more than a certain amount. IoT service has less than five devices connected, etc. So alerts help me to stay informed. It's based essentially on certain thresholds that I can set. And it also has, um, in some cases, allows us to have some corrective action, right? So I might trigger a PowerShell function, a script that essentially fixes the problem if I know exactly what the problem is to that end. And there you can see, you know, some of these alerts. And then last but certainly not least, we've got App Insights. And gosh, I can probably spend two hours talking about App Insights. App Insights is is essentially Azure Monitor on steroids, <laughs> right? So you can see there that it's compre comprehensive monitoring for apps, not just web apps, Windows applications, console applications. I can instrument all of those. It looks after my infrastructure, right? So what's happening at infrastructure level? What errors are there? It even tracks my dependencies, right? So if, I'm, if I've got an Azure function, that's integrating with a storage account and reading from a storage account, it'll come up with telemetry data to show on average your request to the storage account um, is taking so long, right? This allows me to kind of pin down where I can optimize my application and where I can make things a lot, lot better. So there you can see request rates, dependency rates, response times, failure rates for that matter, page views, right? My page performance. How long does it take for my page to actually load? until it shows everything that the user is supposed to be seeing. Um, tracking things like Ajax calls from my page, um, web pages, right? So I might have a JavaScript that calls out to some REST API. How long does it take? Um, you know, how many failure rates do you have in those requests? User and session counts, other performance counters, et cetera. Best thing to do here, trust me, is just to show you what App Insights can do. So I've got an App Insights um, component here, and um, you know it is the uh, Jazz 204 App Insights scenario. And from here, you will see that I've essentially got an application map. And the application map is showing me a couple of things here. It's showing me a function application, and it's showing me, uh, you know, um, a web application. Uh, if I look at if I look at this. App Insights instance, it's even going to show me, it's even going to show me over the last sort of, let's say, you know, seven days, it's going to show me my functions with dependencies. There you can see I've got an always on function, and the always on function is querying an Azure data table, right? Simple little function app that I built. Um, I've, you know, contact me if you want the source code. It's, it's, it's really, really straightforward. It is on GitHub. You just need the URL. I'll give that to you. And there you can see it's interacting with, uh, with uh, storage accounts. It's even interacting with Cosmos DB. And it shows me on average 27 milliseconds to interact with Azure storage data tables, right? So we've also got things like smart detection. And smart detection is going to use some of our Azure AI capabilities. And it's going to see, but you're getting these issues, but you're only getting these issues under these and these conditions and circumstances. Stuff that might take you weeks to figure out, smart detection is going to use some of our Azure AI capabilities and it's going to pin down exactly what those specific conditions are when the errors are occurring and that will allow you to find the issues a lot quicker but make you understand whether these are issues you should be solving. Maybe it's actually an issue only if someone is using a specific browser, for example, and, you know, and if you look at your stats, you might see that only 2% of your users are using that browser. Not a high priority to fix that in your application. We've also got some live metrics here, right? And you'll notice that I'm going to crack open these live metrics, and it's going to show me virtually nothing. It's a little bit like watching paint dry. But the minute I go hit my weather forecast here, right, and my, my error, then you will start seeing some of those requests coming through here. There you can see there's a 404 error. And you can see localhost 5001. All of these are coming from our local environment, right? That request was actually successful. 
this request resulted in a 404 error, and you can see some of this telemetry data coming through here. Um, we've got things like, uh, for example, the application map. If I can drill down a little bit more on this, uh, just to uh, give you an indication, if I go for the last seven days, there should be some more data there. There you can see I've got my I've got my application. If I go for top failing request by name, there you can see get blobs, set table data. I can click on get blobs and it'll actually show me here uh, that get blobs is actually failing. And if I drill into my samples, you'll notice that there is a, a get blobs option and it shows me down to the exception level um, it shows me down to the individual item level what went wrong. You can see there's a there's an error. The function was programmatic, programmatic, they called via the API, et cetera, and it shows me that entire call stack. So I can actually go and drill down to exactly what I want with this app insights environment and show that information. If I go to my 204 application here and just drill down another section here, Here's some additional information. How many users have I had on my, on my application, right? And it should start filling out some users here in a minute. There we go, two users, right? Nothing too wonderful. <laughs> uh, I can look at my sessions, for example, right? Two sessions at this point in time. And I can go and look, you know, over the last sort of seven days as well and get sort of comprehensive information that stretches across a period of time. But something that is quite interesting here is... I can actually go and look at my user flows and my user flows is essentially telling me what my users are doing and how my users are navigating around the site. And this is something that you want to use in combination with funnels to essentially, if you were doing an e-commerce web application, I can use this information to understand how my users are using the app and how I can tweak the application so that my users get to what I want them to get to even quicker. Oh, they're first clicking here, then there, and then they are going to, you know, to actually hit on the buy product. Why don't we just put this button right here where they can do it from the start? It's going to get them to buy products quicker, right? And I can go and analyze this and I can go and, you know, drill down into that level of detail to understand how it's being used and how I can optimize the application to do this. On top of that, there are even some additional metrics that you can see here. There's some heart analytics. If you're not familiar with heart analytics, uh, you can see that I can go and specify the last seven days just as an, as an example. I believe that this is something that, that Google actually sort of, you know, coined. Um, heart analytics is essentially, you can see from there, the happiness, um, the engagement, the an adoption, the retention and the task success of the application and all related metrics. So what we what they've basically done is they've said, well, if the user behaves in this way or in that way, it implies that they are quite content and quite happy, right? So we can even bring some of those metrics to the fore. All right, enough of that now. I've gone probably into a little bit more of uh, details than I should have with regards to that, but that's App Insights, custom telemetry information. And that's that for today, ladies and gents. Uh, we spoke about the Azure Advisor that looks over your shoulder the whole time, telling you how to do things better. We saw that the Azure Service Health can tell you what's coming up, what's currently an issue in your environment. And then we looked at a whole array of different tools, the Azure Monitor, Log Analytics, Alerts, and Application Insights, and how you can use these to optimize your environment. So let's see if there are some questions. I apologize. I think I've got like a bit of a sinus thing going with regards to uh, uh, maybe the pollen in the forest here or something. It feels like I'm breathing through my ears. So I'm going to start with Kevin. Kevin's asked, how do you keep logs for longer than 90 days in log analytics? Yeah, so um, essentially... Uh, essentially, um, you can. Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to show you that now. I, we don't have time for that. But it is one of the configuration settings. Uh, if you're struggling with that, uh, um, just let me know, and uh, Kevin, and I'll 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 send you a link if you want um, to show you how to do that. But it is possible to do that. So um, I think this is more of a question for me. 
Um, says, are the event IDs available when reviewing old streams? I have attended five sessions, but don't think I've taken note of every event ID. Um, yes, Vic, the event IDs are actually available um, on every event. So it, they are usually, I mean, I think um, Johan talks about the event IDs to a, in the middle of the event. So you just have to be, um, you just have to look for them. Um, I think we started with this voucher scheme from ep uh, from session episode five. So if you, sorry, episode four, actually, episode four. So yeah, have a look from episode four and you should be able to find the event IDs. Uh, okay, perfect. So um, Rav, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you a, a link on, um, I'm going to send you a link on Teams. And I cannot put something in the chat for some reason, but uh, you can take that link and you can publish it onto the chat. That's Kevin's answer. So I found that that link quickly. Okay. And then I have another question from Vic. Um, sure. For AZ900, do we need to understand these action group examples, logic apps, etc.? Absolutely not. So I just demoed that to give you a little bit more context. Uh, suffice to say, for the exam, all you need to know is what are they? And that's really all. I just, you know, I had an hour. So I went into quite some detail, but it's not necessary to know all of those details. So hopefully it's given you a little bit more context, I'm hoping. Um, okay. Then next question. 42% has no country name. May I know how to fix it? Slash know which country traffic is coming. Yeah, so um, so I'm not 100% sure where that telemetry information came from, actually, right? Uh, 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 I don't think, I actually don't think I'm, I think I'm the only person using this, right? So what I suspect is uh, I've got um, other Azure services that is essentially sort of, you know, uh, interacting with my application and generating some of those noise, essentially. Um, but I have not seen that issue on public-facing web applications. On public-facing web applications, I've always got relatively accurate stats, despite the fact that we don't, um, you know, breach sort of compliance rules around that. Um, but I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. Uh, this is something that... Uh, that um, I've not seen a lot of. I, this is the most I've had today ever in all of my demos. So I'm, I'm really not 100% sure, to be honest. Um, again, reach out to me on LinkedIn or wherever you want. Um, you've got my details and I will um, find the answer for you. Then uh, we have you. a question from which is the best cost-effective solution for monitoring? I have more than 700 databases spread across 50 subscriptions. So looking for a better and cost-effective solution. Yeah, so for that, um, I will recommend Log Analytics, right? Uh, you should be able to configure one centralized Log Analytics workspace and get all your databases to push all their log, and log information to a central log analytics where you can centrally query all that information, all right? Uh, so, so log analytics is ideal for that sort of thing, right? Because there you can run queries that query the logs across all of those databases. So that's probably the best starting point for that. Um, failing that, what I might also do, and I can probably demo this quickly, I know we've run out of time here, um, but you will notice that uh, if I go to one of my services, for example, where's my service here? Let's go for my application. There's my web app. You'll notice that we've got some diagnostic settings here. And I don't think I've got diagnostic settings set up. But you can see there that I can specify everything I want to set up from a diagnostic perspective. And I can send it all to a centralized log, log analytics workspace. But probably for that volume, it might actually be better to use the event hub. And the event hub is essentially going to allow me to, to do uh, 
you know, um, like a, a big data type um, a solution on top of all that telemetry information. So, so that's maybe two of the options that you can take a look at. Log Analytics Workspace should be able to cut it. If not, use the event hub, aggregate the information in an event hub, and then use something like, uh, like um, you know, stream analytics to query that information and, you know, output some of the, that information into something like Power BI, for example. I hope that answers the question. Um, so we're out of time, but I think we can take one more question. And which is, can I have multiple app insights connected to the same log analytics workspace? So, so as far as I'm aware, um, uh, every time you create, uh, every time you create the app insights, it's going to create it's it's going to create a, a, a new one. But I'm not one. I haven't tried this, but I think you can, right? So, if I go for app insights, for example. And I create a new app insights. I'm pretty sure that at some point there you can see I can point it to the log analytics workspace. So yeah, you should be able to do that. The problem is most of the time when we create web apps, we create the, the app insights at the same time. So yeah, I should be able to point all of them to the same log analytics workspace. If you are doing everything from the portal uh, from creating your app then it's going to automate certain things and then it's going to create you know a host of them but if you create the apps inside specifically then you can point it to a, a log analytics workspace in the background so yes i believe that that is possible all right i hope that answered the question yeah um okay great um thank you very much johan and thank you everyone for joining um, if you didn't know, today was the last episode of 10 Tuesdays. And obviously, thank you very much to Johan for delivering these sessions. And I hope you all enjoyed them. The playlist will be available on our Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. Um, and I have posted the link in the chat. Uh, and then this specific episode would also be available in that playlist. So please... If you have missed out on any of the previous episodes, you can jump back right in. Uh, there is a whole lot of information, a whole lot of learnings. This is a very, very informational series, and I hope you learned something, and I hope you will use that 50% exam vouchers. We will contact everybody uh, next week once we have compiled uh, all the data and um, yeah, I just want to say a big thank you to Johan. We um we can't we finished the ten Tuesdays. Well, wow, thank you very much to you. Without you, I would have been able to do this. So yeah. so no thanks to me. I just did the sessions. You know, you did all the donkey work in the background. So <laughs> I, you know, I I would have um you know done this over a fax machine <laughs> if it wasn't for you. So don't stress. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, thank you. And thanks, everyone. Please, I mean, this is a whole lot of amazing information which Johan has shared in these 10 episodes. Please do go back. You can always go back to the um, videos, contact Johan. And if you have any questions, please reach out um, to us at React uh, on Reactor's email address, or reactor at microsoft.com. If you have any questions about the series, anything upcoming, please do that. But till then, um, have a great evening or morning or wherever you are. And we shall see you um, on some other um, series then. Thanks, Thank Johan. You Thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.